Hey guys, Alex Williamson here with the secret history living inside of your aquarium. Today we're going to be talking about Java ferns. They are awesome. They're a great plant for starters or for experts. Uh, if you're just getting into the hobby, they can grow in low light and uh, honestly not the best uh, water conditions. They'll still survive. They are a survivor and to understand how they grow and where they grow and the history of them in the uh, aquatic plant trade and the aquarium uh, fish and pet trade, uh, we have to explain a couple things about them. So first of all, they are great sources of uh, biofilm or algae. So they collect on their leaves. This is just a plain kind. There's also uh, Wendelov, uh, Java, ferns which have kind of like a frayed um it looks it looks kind of like this like an arugula or a carrot leaf and it gets it, it's just a different variety there's several varieties of the java fern and it doesn't matter what you have they all work the same way and the the history of them goes way far back in the aquarium world. So now, they were kept as early as the 1800s because they could live in the low light and they could also live on fairly low nutrients. Now, that's not optimal, though. Um, they also can live in, trans in transit very well. So they've been a big star because they could be shipped from their uh, home regions in Southeast Asia to the U.S. in just a little bit of water or in a humid bag, and they end up surviving um, much more than other plants without looking super damaged. Uh, the other thing is they live in an area that has monsoons. So all of Southeast Asia gets typhoons and monsoons and has a rainy season and a dry season. Now this means that all these freshwater plants that live in the lakes and rivers there needed to adapt. So sometimes there's 50 feet of water and it's raging. Other times there's, you know, six inches of water and it's pretty stagnant and it's hot. And so what these plants have done is just awesome. So this looks like a root ball, right? In any other plant, you'd say that's a root. And for, for, for our purposes, we can call it a root, but it's really a rhizome. And so this complex of rhizomes forms, and oftentimes it'll form around a stone or a piece of wood, and it's made up of these little brown fuzzy hairs. And I can zoom in on the mother plant, which is where I got all the other java ferns that I have have sprouted from this mother plant. And the roots or rhizomes look like this. They've got this kind of rusty red texture. Sometimes I've had people ask, is my java fern uh, rotting or growing fungi? No, it's, uh, it's healthy. So as long as it's green, those little nodes coming out are how it reaches for nutrients. It does it does its photosynthetic thing with the green and the 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 leaves being uh, broad like that and turned outwards towards uh, the sun, and it can live floating on top of the water or the bottom of the water. And because of that, it was a really popular uh, plant in the pet trade. So. All the way back to early aquarium keeping for the Western world of the 1800s, uh, there was a lot of trade with the Dutch East India Company in and out of uh, the Philippines and Indonesia and Thailand, Laos, Taiwan, and they brought back these uh, plants and animals that they were finding, including fish and not too many of them made it back on these long, you know, three or four month voyages, but Java uh, fern can. And so it can live in a variety of water temperatures. It likes, you know, um, semi-tropical to tropical temperatures, uh, as most plants seem to. And it actually grows in a very different way than other plants. So those rhizomes I was talking about, they're found in every single leaf. So I'm going to use this set of scissors as a pointer. So here, 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 all up the leaves, every single one has the potential 
to sprout into a new plant. And like I said, when the season is wet, it would flood. And so you would have these plants that don't actually like to be buried under the soil. They'll sometimes rot if you bury them too deep under the soil. Now, if you have a loose enough gravel or you have a real rich in nutrients silt that allows for water and gas exchange easily, then you can get away with burying them. But they're happier not being buried. So I keep mine out like this, and I've moved this rock here out of the way just so you can see the rhizome and root system. Same with this. So I just keep a rock in front of it, and I kind of wedge it in between two rocks, and it's pretty hardy in that it keeps surviving no problem, even with that pressure of being pinched between the rocks, as long as water can flow. So monsoon season comes, you know, 50 inches of rainfall, and the rhizomes have been growing in the water and they're growing out of the leaves. So it'll it'll take these leaves and they'll start growing out and down. And then what happens is either through turbulence or flooding or wind, waves, other fish, whatever it is, they either break off here at the base and float down river until they catch and wrap around a log or they wrap around a rock or get wedged in between some rapids or, you know, in a pond around another cattail or something like that. Uh, and then those leaves actually start to wither away and melt. And those rhizomes along that, that center line are all connected and they begin to pull in energy. And actually from those, you get these lines or mother colonies of the plant and they'll frequently grow in a line like that at first. After time, they'll start to grow in the other directions also, and you can end up with a, a shrub bigger than this whole tank. Now, the great thing about them, they can live in low light. They're used to being in dark rain. They're used to being in heavy sun and, uh, you know, living in a puddle too. But they're just a great hardy plant and I highly recommend them. The shrimp love them. The, uh, the fish love them for their fry and sleeping at night. The tetras love sleeping in them. Guppies love sleeping in them. They're cheap. Uh, I was able to get this one plant. I bought a larger uh, plant that came about this size and have been able to propagate throughout my tanks in just a matter of months. Uh, the ferns. So starting off with uh, plants in your tank, java ferns are, are an excellent choice. And all you need to do to propagate them is fix them to something in the tank. And once you see the spindly guys, you can cut it free and then remount that. And then other than that, you just want good nutrients in the tank. You know, potassium, nitrogen, uh, zinc, iron, things like that. Not in high levels, you know, where the fish are going to have a problem, but in levels for your plant. You can get lots of different fertilizing options. I'll let you guys check that out. I happen to use Easy Green made by Aquarium Co-op in Edmonds. Uh, they don't pay me or anything, uh, but I love their products and their videos, and check them out. I can leave a link in the description about them. Uh, Getting back to the history of it really quick, though. So a lot of the silk plants that you've seen, or plastic plants, mimic java fern. So java fern, as well as uh, kabamba, which is this guy back here, and as well as different, um, like this wisteria plant and different stock plants, were all the first early ones. And in early aquarium keeping, it was thought that plants and fish could live a full life with just each other as an ecosystem, that you barely needed to add food, it didn't need to change the water. If you had a good-sized pond or tank, it would be a balanced system. And actually, we're getting back to that now. If you do things right, you can make it almost a closed loop if you really want to with the right fish and plants and bacterias and things like that. But in the 50s and 60s, when aquarium pets other than goldfish and bettas and things like that started to become more popular, uh, 
once guppies and other things like that started to get more colorful and hardy and living in warmer tanks, a lot of people wanted silk plants just because it was not really known how to take care of them. It, it, it wasn't like the 1800s and the turn of the century in uh, places like Germany or in New York or Paris or London where you'd have these naturalist societies that would take care of aquariums, the early Western aquariums. And so they made silk plants that looked like this. And so that's why you see the variety of silk or plastic plants that look like that. It's because they are one of the great uh, early plants to be introduced into the aquarium trade. They ship well. And uh, that's just kind of a fun little quirk. Um, I think if you're going to have them in your tank, something that looks like this, why not have the real thing? Now, for me, I was saying that they could grow in low light with just the nutrients of your fish, and that's true, but they'll grow slower. For me, I've been growing them at a pretty good rate. I have a Fluval uh, 2.0 light above this, and I've got the easy green that I add, plus I've got a good amount of fish in here and CO2, and shrimp that take care of any sort of junk growing on them and also are able to then, uh, you know, they take care of the plant, the plant takes care of them, same with the little guppy uh, fry. And so what I'm going to do later today is I'm going to take this leaf here, for instance, that has rhizomes coming out of about 10 places on it if you look all throughout it, and a few others, and I'm gonna cut those right at the base. And then what I'll do is I'll take that and I will fix it to something in another tank or this tank. Maybe I'll wrap it around uh, this, this uh, driftwood and you can either use super glue, AKA cyanoacrylate or crazy glue. Uh, you can get it at the dollar store and the plant will withstand that. You can actually do that. You can just glue the rhizomes right on there. And then the, the material that's withering away that in nature, a lot of times the leaves will break free and intentionally get weaker there once the rhizomes have sprouted at the end and started to make these little balls, um, you can cut as low as you can on the plant and then you can take that and just glue it right onto the end of wood or put it on a rock or let it float in your tank for a while. Any of those ways, it'll survive because it's used to doing that in nature. That's its natural state. And it's a great plant to propagate. It's not an expensive or an exotic plant, but I highly recommend it. And you're able to then take this mother colony, which I like to keep larger, and then start these other groups. And then over time, they start to grow out in other dimensions other than just the left to right line of the leaf. And they're just kind of a quirky, cool, ancient plant. Um, Ferns are one of the older plants, and these are aquatic ferns, whereas land ferns have spores, and they put spores out, which then land and are clones of themselves, almost like a mushroom has spores, and uh, rather than being pollinated, uh, these have rhizomes, and so they make a wonderful plant. They're hard to kill in that you know, they grow rather slow under low light conditions. And when something grows slow, it also dies slow. And when something grows fast, it can go wrong very fast. So these are a good plant if you've got someone who's new to the hobby. Um, and they're also a good plant if you just have a big tank and you're trying to create a nice uh, lush background or hiding place for breeding fish. So thanks for staying tuned. I will put a link to the Easy Green fertilizer that I use from Aquarium Co-op. Great place. Shout out to them. Not getting paid or anything by them, but I, uh, I just like their establishment and the folks who work there. And their uh, internet presence is great, what Corey has informationally. And I hope this was helpful and educational and that maybe you can do something with it. I'd love to see pictures of your Java ferns if you have a really old one that's really big and bushy and, you know, two feet tall and two feet wide, that'd be awesome to see. So either uh, comment it, send me a picture, post a video, whatever. I'd love to interact with you guys a little more on this channel than I have been. And uh, 
Don't forget to subscribe and give it a thumbs up if this is helping you out. And I hope you have a great day. And don't forget to keep on swimming, guys.